It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. I enjoy listening to Susan Smith's podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once. The other day I was listening to her interview with Maud McDonald, and when I heard that Maud had been a roller derby girl, I had to send her a note. I just love roller derby, and I had questions. Maud is the retro quilter, and she has been designing beautiful modern quilts. Maud, I am so happy that I heard you on Susan Smith's podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once. And I am so glad that you agreed to be on my podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I am thrilled that you reached out, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, let's get started with where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, and that's where I live today. Now, during that, did you travel away and come back, or you have been there your whole life? No, I did live in Toronto for over a decade. I love the big city. But after two kids, we decided to leave the big city. And after a few speed bumps, what have you, some other trials, we ended up back in Niagara Falls and we're loving it. It's a beautiful area. It is. It's very gorgeous. And all my family's here, so we're quite happy. Ma, could you share a special childhood memory? Yes. So when I was about, say, 11 or 12 years old, my family took a trip to Austin, Texas to visit some family. And let me preface this a little bit by saying that my father is probably the biggest NASCAR fan you've ever met in your life or would ever meet. And so we decided to go go go-karting the one day. And my preteen self sat right in the front go-kart and all these much older teenage boys were behind me and I was right there in the front. If you know anything about racing, there's kind of like an invisible line that you can follow and no one will be able to get by you. Well, somehow I instinctively knew to follow this invisible line and I had the slowest go-kart on the track but none of these teenage boys could get by me so I would just go puttering along the track and just waving at my dad and I you know won the race and my dad still talks about it he's still so proud of me for feeding those boys and winning the race. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Let's jump over to your employment. I have been a stay-at-home mom for quite some time now. My kids are five and seven years old. And just in the last few years, I have transitioned to become a quilt pattern designer in which I make quilt patterns with a retro type flair because that's what I'm all about. But previously, I have been all sorts of things. I've been a makeup artist, a hair colorist. I've been bartender. I've worked in a vintage shop. I've done all sorts of things. Oh, neat. And being a stay-at-home mom, that involves so much taking care of those little ones. It is the most full-time job you'd ever have. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Besides quilting, are there other crafts you do or have done? I've tried just about everything. 
Like if you took me to an art store or craft store, I could probably go to any section of the store and say, yep, I've done that. But when I was younger, I drew a lot. I love drawing. Sometimes now I like to paint. On occasion, I've been trying to learn a little bit of how to paint with oils. And mostly from watching Bob Ross videos. <laughs> but another thing that I do really like to do is ice dyeing. And I do that more so with fabrics for the back of my quilts. And it's a lot of fun. Can you describe how that works? Yeah. So I pre-treat the fabric with something that's called a soda ash. It sort of preps the pH levels and what have you. And then you cover it in ice, the fabric in ice. I've actually done it with snow because I'm in Canada and there's lots of snow right now and snow works beautifully. And then on top of the snow, I use a powdered dye and I just sprinkle the dye on. And so when it melts, there's a reaction between the coldness, the temperature of the snow and ice to the chemical in the dye and they just have this beautiful bleeding effect and they all sort of melt into each other and it's beautiful. Oh, neat. Even though the snow or ice is melting, do you bring that inside the house like where it's very warm or like inside a garage where it's warmer but cool? I just do it in my basement in like a big Rubbermaid container. And then I've got a rack. It's actually an old metal shoe rack that I put everything on. So there's sort of room for all the melted liquid to go. But then it's contained and I put the lid on so my little ones can't get to it. (laughs) Interesting. How about other hobbies you might have? My husband and I... We like to play a lot of board games. That's about it. Especially these days. (laughs) Yeah. Now, what really caught my attention when you were talking to Susan is that I heard you were on a roller derby team before you had children. (laughs) Yeah. How did you find out about roller derby? When I first moved, to Toronto. It was in 2005. And I was working at a restaurant and a co-worker of mine noticed a flyer saying that there was going to be tryouts. And, you know, she said, this really seems like something that you would like. But it was at the very beginning of the league, the teams, everything being formed. So it was there pretty much right from the beginning. Now, I want to mention that I have a daughter that's a Charlotte roller derby girl. So, of course, roller derby piqued my interest because I love it, too. (laughs) And when Susan was interviewing you, you guys mentioned it, and that was neat. But knowing about roller derby, I was like, well, what's your roller derby name? I So many questions. (laughs) So many questions that were not answered. So, of course, I had to contact you. (laughs) Well, my maiden name was Lauder, like Fort Lauderdale or S.C. Lauder. So my derby name was Slaughter Lauder. And still, I have friends that call me Slaughter still. (laughs) (laughs) And my number was 11 just because it was my favorite number. But there were other girls that had different numbers. There was 7 cents or 14, 12, 80, things like this. Everybody had a lot of fun making up names and numbers and things. I understood that they tried to give unique numbers, but it doesn't necessarily always work, right? Well, when I played, we were like the start we could choose whatever we wanted so in your daughter's league and that she's playing a bit later which is so cool by the way 
you know, there might be a bit more restrictions because I know as the years have gone on, they try not to use the same numbers as a previous player. Yeah, and I I actually think she tried to get 11 and she couldn't get it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she got 111. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so fun. And probably a lot of people don't realize the track. Back when I was growing up in the 70s, the track was, I don't even know what they called that track, but it was slanted. And now they play on a flat track. Did you play on a flat track? Yeah, it's only flat track in Canada, or it might have changed since I played, but at the time that I played, was only flat track. I know a few places in the States has a banked track, but I've never been on one. Even I would love to even try it still to just do a few laps on a banked track one day. (laughs) Yeah. My daughter plays on flat track, so I didn't even know there were banked tracks around still. I really think there's only a couple. I want to say... New York, the Gotham City Roller Girls, and I feel like in Texas they do. Hmm. But I'm not 100% on that. Another thing I really liked about roller derby is, to me, the rules are so simple. Yeah, so the basic rules, like a flat track would be two straightaways and four curves. And you're going to have five people on each team on the track at once. Four of those girls are going to be blockers. And one of those girls, she wears a star on her helmet and she's the jammer. She's the girl that gets points. So to start a jam, (laughs) that's what we call it, is at the end of one of the straightaways, both jammers start And closer to the first turn is where that pack of girls are. And one whistle will blow. The pack, which is all those blockers, start skating. Second whistle blows. The jammers go and they have to try to get through all of the blockers, all of that pack. So what the jammers need to do is to get through And not the first time they've gone around, but the second time that they go through that pack and every person they pass, legally, they get a point for. And the blockers, of course, are trying to help their jammer while stopping the opposite jammer. And that's essentially the game. It is so fun. It was a blast. I miss it a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, And what position did you play? I was a jammer. I didn't really like jamming too much, but I would play it. But I was a blocker. I was usually the back blocker. So I was after that jammer big time. (laughs) (laughs) And while you're talking, I'm just picturing watching the game, which they call about. Yep. It's so fun. And, you know, not a lot of people know how it's played. They just more or less know a bunch of girls hit each other and don't really understand it. But it is rough and it is fun. And the coolest thing about it is that those girls will knock you down, but they will help you right back up. Yeah. I have seen that camaraderie, even on opposing teams, how helpful they are and it's really great to see oh yeah it's very much a community and I feel like there's this sort of bond roller derby is not for everybody so if you're out there and you're playing it there's a mutual respect whether you're on whatever team Mm -hmm. I'm remembering when my daughter was playing jammer on one belt and the blockers would block her, and she was pushing so hard, and then they would just back up and let her fall. <laughs> oh, now, man. Again and again. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely have some favorite 
roller derby memory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. I didn't realize I could get into cheering on a sport so much because I'm more mild-mannered, sit-back. People don't notice me. And then I started going to her bouts, and I'm up on my feet yelling, and it's not me. <laughs> it's really funny. Oh, but it's infectious, isn't it? Right? It is. Like you just You get so into it. I'm telling you, even if I was not playing any bout I ever went to, I would lose my voice. Yeah. Just because I was yelling so much. Well, I'll tell you, my parents, when they used to go to the game, they would have, like, my team, which was the Smoke City Betty's. They were on the front. And Slaughter, Slaughter is my daughter, written on the back. And oh, the go to every game with that shirt. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, funny, eh? Yeah. Do you think some of your roller derby may show up in your quilting? I think it's present in the quilting community. And that the quilting community is a supportive and open space to be. So I find that commonality very much so between roller derby and quilting. It's lovely to be part of such a supportive and sincere community. Like people just want to help. People just want you to succeed. It's just genuine. Mm -hmm. How did you find out about quilting? My mother, she made a couple quilts growing up. But I never took to it because, how do I say this nicely? She swore a lot when (laughs) when she quilted. I don't know what the problem was. That was basically my first exposure to it. My grandmother made me a quilt once, but she was more of a knitter. So it's not like I come from like a long line of quilters or anything like that. When I first made my first quilt, it was for my dad with all of his NASCAR shirts. And I just thought it would be a cool gift. And it was terrible. But he still has it, and he still loves it. And that was definitely the project that got me into the quilting world and got me hooked. I have seen a meme about quilting and swearing, but I couldn't quote it for you. (laughs) (laughs) So evidently your mom wasn't the only one. (laughs) I found these tags by Kylie and the machine. And I had to get them because the tag or the label, it says made with lots of love and swear words yeah. and something like that. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Do you have a favorite quilt or quilt pattern you'd like to use? My favorite quilt is the one that my grandma made me. There was only one, and it's extremely cherished because I was very close with my grandmother. As for ones for me that I have made, one of the first quilts I made was with all vintage sheets, and I love that one. And now that I'm starting to make my own patterns, so I just came out with, two patterns. One is called Boogie Nights and the other one's called Stellar. So the first versions of those are pretty special to me as well. And they look great on your website. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. And while you're quilting, is there a tool that you are so thankful you have? I cannot live without my snips. I love my snips. I use them for everything. And I have the Fiskars brand and they stay really sharp 
and I can cut through like my quilt sandwich corners and I just love them. Oh, neat. They must be really sharp because this is not the first time I've heard that. So that is really cool. <laughs> is there a part of the process you like better than the other or do you like each step? I am more of one of those people that I like each step because I feel like, you know, I'm picking out fabrics and it's very exciting, but then I get it home and I'm really excited to cut into it. And then by the time I'm finishing up my cutting and I'm kind of getting maybe even a little bored with the cutting, I'm going, oh, but piecing's next and piecing's going to be great. So I'm always kind of excited to move on to the next phase. With the exception that I really hate piecing a backing together. And I don't know why, but I don't care for it. <laughs> Interesting. You mentioned finding the material. Are you a person that picks out the design first and then goes and looks for the material? Or do you see material you like and then bring it home and try to figure out what it would look good in? I do both. Yeah, I do both. There's definitely fabric that I look at it and say, I have to have that. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I have to have it. One day the project will come. And then there's other times that I look at a pattern and I'm going, okay, I need to get this fabric for that because it'll be perfect. So I go back and forth. Oh, neat. That mixes it up a bit. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Tell me about your worst quilting experience. <laughs> so most of my quilting journey or experience has been with a brother straight stitch machine. And late last year, Baby Lock got rid of the crescendo model. And that was like my dream machine. They changed the model or upgraded it, what have you. So the Baby Lock Crescendo went on sale on discount. And so I went to my local quilt shop and I scooped one up. Well, on the Baby Lock, the needle moves. It's not like my straight stitch. And I do not know how many times... I would have that needle in a different position and I would go to quilt and the needle would break. And you know how terrifying that can be <laughs> when a needle breaks. And I'm telling you, like I must have had a series of small heart attacks because I did it so many times. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it was just terrible. So it's gotten a lot better, but... Yeah, I still do it every once in a while. Just I'm, I'm so accustomed to the straight stitch even still. When I think of needles breaking, I'm always afraid of it flying up in my face. It never yes. has, but I don't know why I worry about that. But is that part of your concern? Yeah, I had one, a little chip of it, like ding me in the forehead. Oh, no. So that really freaked me out. But so far, there's been no injuries. <laughs> And I'm getting much better at it. But for the first few weeks, it was just nightmarish. It would just scare me so badly. Wow. What has drawn you to quilt rather than use your time on other things? I think the process of it really suits me. I've always been creative and artistic, and I've always needed to work with my hands. And it keeps my attention with all the phases while you're working on one project. So it's like very rewarding at the end when you do reach, when you finished a project, when you finished a quilt. So I think it just, it just suits me really well. Yeah. Even when I started the podcast and asking the question of, the different parts, I didn't realize how many different parts. It's even broken down more than I had originally thought. So there are so many steps that that does keep you changing with it. Yeah, and it's 
depending too on what you do within quilting. If you do paper piecing, then there's more steps. If you are designing a pattern and testing it, there's more steps. So there's a lot of different tangents within the world of quilting too. Mm -hmm. Who do you tend to make your quilts for? Friends and family, I would say. I like the idea of things getting passed down. So I like to make quilts for my friends and my family. My quilt patterns, I would say anyone who likes retro flair or something fun or something out of the box, that's who I make those patterns for, which is me, essentially. (laughs) And how many projects are you working on right now? Well, let me see here. I have a pattern I am working on currently that will come out in early May. It is with a tech editor. So I'm working on that. I am working on two quilts right now. One is a secret. It's for a friend. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm working on another quilt, a Stellar quilt. Stellar is my second pattern that I just came out with. So I'm working on a different version with that. And working on some test patterns of this spring pattern that's coming out, which will be called Retro Daisy. So neat. So how many is that? One, two... Like four, four or five? (laughs) I think it was four. There you go. Can you give a quilting tip? Yes. So as inclusive as this community is and supportive as this community is, I still believe that there are the quilting police out there that want to tell you that so-and-so, whatever method is wrong. And so my advice is to ignore the quilting police. (laughs) You do you. Do what works for you. Yeah. Great advice. Now, I'm assuming you started quilting as a hobby. How did it go from a hobby to a business? So, yeah, it started off as a hobby, more or less making quilts for friends and family. And then people started asking me to make some quilts and it's an expensive hobby. So I started doing more custom orders, but you know, it's with a friend and family discount. And I sometimes was doing things that I wasn't really excited about. So I really wanted to start making the things that I wanted to make. And during this time, I was realizing this natural flair that I have for retro and vintage, because I love that stuff. You should see my house, but there wasn't really a market. Like there wasn't really quilt patterns with that style out there. And what was out there was like very specific. And a lot of it was paper piece, which I wasn't really interested in doing. So that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to try writing my own patterns and I'm a firm believer that things happen when they are supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so just around that time, Quilters Candy's pattern writing course just happened to be coming around. So I signed up for that and I haven't stopped designing quilts since. Oh, neat. It's great how things fall right into place, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, really, it's just like, I very much believe that things are supposed to happen when they're supposed to happen. Now, tell me your business name and how you came up with the name. Oh, my goodness. So this is so cliche, but I literally had it in a dream. Like, I woke up and I said, I'm the retro quilter. (laughs) Previously, I was going by Made by Maud 
on Instagram until I woke up with this dream of, no, I'm going to be the retro quilter. And I changed it. And that's how that came about. I mean, it's very fitting because of my obsession with all things retro and all things quilty. So there you go. That's so neat. And I read your tagline, modern quilted goods with a retro vibe. Can we dig into yeah. that a little bit? It's now, I think, like quilting patterns. I'm steering away from making like customer custom quilts. But yeah, I think that the designs that I make are very modern, especially depending on what fabrics that you choose. But I do try to have a fun, different, and retro-inspired flair to them. They're certainly not traditional. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just curious. When I hear the word retro, in my mind, and this may just be me, I'm saying retro diner, which would be like a 50s diner. But what does your retro... I think that a lot of people have a different connotation with the word. So for a lot of people, retro could be 80s or even 90s now, actually. But for me, I more or less think of the 60s and the 70s. So that's the timeline that I choose to focus on. But absolutely, I would think of, you know, a 50s diner and like a rockabilly type flair and stuff like that. But I'm more focused on the 60s, 70s eras. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I love the flower pattern that's on your website. To me, that said 60s. Yeah, yeah. That's (laughs) actually a Wabasso bed sheet. (laughs) (laughs) It looks great. Thank you. When did you open your online shop? Just last year. I think it was maybe October around there. So it has not been even a year yet. Okay. So how did you feel when someone purchased one of your quilts the first time? Like just incredibly flattered, you know, like it really makes my heart feel real fuzzy. (laughs) And that, you know, I've contributed to... Something that will hopefully bring that person lots of lovely memories for their family. I love that aspect to quilting. And I just feel like quilts are something that people naturally cherish because they do take a lot of time and they do take a lot of effort and they're not cheap to make. So I think people automatically tend to care for them and cherish them a little bit. and. They get used, hopefully, every day in their everyday lives. So, therefore, they're mingled in with memories and all sorts of good things. And I get to be a part of that. So, I think that's really, really special. Mm -hmm. I saw on your website, not only you had quilts, but you had some quilted bags. Those looked really nice. Thank you. And they look sturdy, too. Is it harder or easier or just different to make those? They're just different. It's just a different thing. Sometimes I think, especially when you work on these big projects being quilts, it's nice to have a smaller project here and there. So that's how those came about. But yeah, it's just different. And I think we touched on this. Are you still making custom quilts or are you just going to quilts you made, make and sell them? I am more or less going to be focusing on my digital PDF patterns. And I'm, you know, like if it's a friend or a family member, I will do a custom quilt. But for otherwise not, no, I'm not doing that. I'm actually steering away from doing, like, having quilted goods in my shop as well. It's just sort of whatever I 
started with. Because initially I thought that was going to be what my store was about. It was going to be about quilted goods. And now I've discovered designing patterns and that's the path that I'm going to choose. Great. Thinking of making a pattern from concept to getting it out on the PDF, I know there's a lot of steps. About how long does that take? Oh, goodness, that's that's a loaded question. It depends <laughs> on a few things. I use Adobe Illustrator more mm-hmm. or less to make the pattern itself. But oftentimes, I design the pattern in the EQ8 software. But I know other classmates of mine have used the app Canva to make a pattern with it full with instructions and diagrams and everything. So I think a lot of it is just how fluent you are in whatever platform you are using. So, of course, and when you're just learning that stuff, it's going to take a lot longer, right? But, yeah, there's a lot more into it that I did not realize until I started doing it. That's for sure. Uh-huh. Always those details. Mm-hmm. And where can we go to find your business? You can go to www.theretroquilter.com. And I'm also on Instagram at the Retro Quilter. And I do have a YouTube channel. However, at this particular time, I only have one video up, but I do have intentions of putting more up. So you can find me on YouTube as the Retro Quilter as well. Great. Be looking forward to that. Is there anything else you would like to share with me? I just think it's really awesome that your daughter plays derby and (laughs) that you go and cheer her on and everything. And I just wanted to say thank you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. So thanks for having me here. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Uh Bye now. Bye. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>